What's up, hobby friends, and welcome to my video tutorial for Marvel Crisis Protocol's Lockjaw. I've thrown up the colors and paints I've used on this miniature on the screen. So if you want to go ahead and jot those down, you can pause the video, make your notes, and then we'll continue with the tutorial. To prep for Lockjaw, I've chosen to keep the model and the base separate. This is so I can do the airbrushing and the painting on both without having to work underneath the model. There's a lot of detailed elements on the underside of Lockjaw that I felt would be important to be able to get under. And the base is fairly large and would get in the way of my brush in particular around the chest area, the paws, etc. And then because I'll be airbrushing both of them in separate colors, it just made sense it was easy to keep them separate. They're not integrated in any way. So I can airbrush and paint the base without having to worry about a model on top. I can airbrush and paint the dog without worrying about getting overspray on the base. And when the model's complete, I can put the two together. When you're building the model, you want to make sure that you do some gap filling. This, I don't know the exact release date of Lockjaw, but it carries some of the hallmarks of Atomic Mass's older models. So some of the seams, in particular down the sides of the back, down the underside of the body, and then where the legs meet the back of the body. They're fairly significant, similarly on the chest here, on the shoulders. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you use your putty of choice. I use Milliput because it's fairly soft, malleable, and I can sand it afterwards to a nice smooth finish. But brown stuff, green stuff, even Vallejo plastic putty should suffice. For the actual arms themselves, where it does meet in a bit of the fold, you can get away with not doing some significant gap filling because the seam is hidden in the deep crease or recess of the fold. Although if you do end up using washers or particular on the model, if the gap is significant, you may want to just put some gloss varnish or Mod Podge in there to seal it up. Otherwise the wash will seep through. So what I'll do is I'll prime the model with Vallejo Surface Primer Black. I'll go in with some brushing steps very quickly. I'll paint the base off camera and then we will dive on into the figure itself. The base is gonna be painted in a similar manner to the rest of my Marvel miniatures. I'll have links in the video description below that walks through the process on some of my older models. So I'm gonna start with AK Graphite and I'm gonna apply a base coat onto the base itself. I'm gonna use World War I French Brown and give a base coat to all of the skin and fur on the dog. I'm gonna follow this up with a 50-50 highlight of number six Earth Yellow and World War I French Brown. Focusing mainly on the front and top of the body, I want the underside to be in shadow. You can do this step by hand. I'm lazy, so I'm using the airbrush. My first highlight on the skin is gonna be using pure number six Earth Yellow. And what I'm looking to do is target the musculature. So imagine if you were painting skin on a regular figure, you want to make sure that you're picking up the muscle groups, leaving the deepest recesses or crevices, particularly in the folds around the shoulders, the neck, the jowls, and particularly the forehead on the face in your deepest shadow. When you're painting the muscles of the dog, you want to make sure that you're connecting the muscles to form one shape or one, one volume. You don't want to highlight and shade each individual muscle as a separate component without connecting it, because it can end up making it feel more like armor, less like flesh, with a layer of skin or fur on top. What I'm also doing at this stage is I am using the brush strokes in a sort of short cross-hatching pattern. This is a way to smooth up my transitions a little bit as I built up my layers. So in some of the brighter areas, you can see that by Varying up the direction of the brush strokes, it hides a lot of the, the sketching in the phase, helps to smooth those transitions as you build up your colors, but it also allows for where these strokes show through to help simulate a bit more of that fur texture. So where I do want that texture to show through, I'm making sure that my brush strokes are applied in approximately the direction of the fur. Usually it's front to back, but in some parts of the body, like on the butt, the hind legs, it does go top to bottom. From there, I'm gonna start mixing in pale yellow to form my next layer of highlights. And really this is just a continuation of the previous step, 
I'm using a lot of short brush strokes. I'm using that cross hatching technique and I'm focusing more and more on those raised surfaces. I'm still joining all the different muscle groups, all the different folds where they would connect, but I'm starting to leave more and more of that mid-tone and shadow tone showing through to really develop that the highlighting process of the body. And then finally, I'm gonna go back in with a mix of earth yellow and French brown, diluted in the airbrush. And my goal here is to basically underspray the miniature. So low PSI in combination with a really diluted mixture in the airbrush effectively forms a glaze. And what I'm using this for is to smooth up my transitions as well as bring back some of those deeper shadows, any sort of rough areas in the blending or in the texturing, especially again in those mid and shadow tones will get smoothed out by this step. You can do this by hand, but I find particularly for larger models or larger surfaces, at least starting with the airbrush to do some of the broader uh, glazing before going by hand, speeds up a lot of the process and helps to just make the entire process quicker. To paint the pattern on the underside of the skin, I'm using AK Light Earth. And this is the reference photo that I'm gonna be using as my sort of point of reference. So I'm going for the more traditional English bulldog patterning. They've got this gorgeous white underbelly as well as on the inside of the legs. Sometimes it gets to the tail. Um, it really varies depending on the, I guess the particular dog that you see. The patterns are never the same. They're for the most part fairly symmetrical left and right. Although there is some variation sometimes in how far down it goes onto the leg or how far. In this example, uh, you can see the back hind leg one is white on the inside and one, it doesn't seem like the white does bleed over so it's probably orange with a hint of white just on the inner part of the thigh. So to achieve this, what I'm doing is I'm just taking that um, base color and I'm just applying a nice even base coat over all of the underside. I'm gonna start with a thin diluted layer, create the outline, before then going in and filling the internal space to get a nice even coat. And once again, I'm continuing those short um, crisscrossing hatch strokes to create some smoother applications of paint. And then where necessary, especially in the deep shadows, I can sort of create a subtle or softer fade or blend to sort of um, fake the transition up to the shadows. From there, I'll mix a 50-50 mix of pale sand and light earth, and I'm going to highlight the brightest areas of this off-white patterning. So a lot of this is mainly gonna be focused on the face. We're looking at the jowls, the cheeks, top of the head and the forehead, and then the upper parts of the arms and shoulders. Where it gets down to directly underneath, so on the belly, the insides of the legs, I'm gonna be Fairly dark with this color. I'm not gonna apply much of this highlighting. I'm gonna let the base color show as sort of that deeper shadow. I'm gonna use some AK Tenebrous Gray and I'm gonna start to base coat the black areas of the face. So we're looking at the nose, a line running right down the cleft of what would be the upper lip. And then we're also gonna target the actual lips themselves. So on the top and bottom, use your reference if you're not sure how it should look. Paint in the patterning and then with ash gray, we'll apply our very sharp highlights. I know I'm gonna be using some gloss varnish to um, create a sort of shiny uh, wet effect on this area later. So I'm not gonna over highlight this too much because we're also gonna have that gloss varnish layer creating some extra fake highlights based on the environmental lighting. To paint the gums and the tongue, I'm gonna to start with a base coat of AK Carmine. Make sure that I get it all up in the mouth, especially on the undersides of the palette, get all of the tongue, including the top and the bottom, and make sure that you get it all the way up to the lips, including those three little nubs on either side. If you've ever actually met a dog, a lot of them have these sort of pronounced nodes or modules or whatever they are on the upper parts of their lower lip and I think it's really important to pick those out. From there 
I'm gonna start mixing in uh, a combination of Carmine Light Flesh. And then as I get brighter and brighter, I'm gonna mix in incremental amounts of pale yellow to help warm up the color tones. I found that the Carmine and the, the Flesh Tone by themselves was too pinkish. The pale yellow will help to balance it out, bring a little bit back more warmth. You see that here, it's not quite a, a cold or a, a neutral pink. There's a bit of a salmon tone to it. And so what I'm doing is I'm just wet blending onto the tongue, especially if it's a larger surface area. And then to help create that sort of taste bud texture, as I highlight up, I'm gonna to start to stipple in my highlights to get that textured effect going. One thing that can be really helpful when you're painting the, the tongue and the fur and really any sort of textured element is to use a bit of an older brush. So far on this entire model, all I've done is I've used an older brush where the tip really isn't quite so sharp. After a couple of brush strokes, the tip tends to splay out and you end up with these um, sort of a, a mess of bristles. I use that to help create the texture because as the paint is applied with the brush, it naturally uh, lays out and it gets paint in sort of a nice um, combed pattern. What I'm doing as well is as I'm highlighting up with this pink mixture, I'm applying some glazes around the nose and on the, I guess the cleft of that upper lip, get some of that rosiness in there. Again, use your references. I'm not trying to make this up. I'm just using the photo that I have on my phone that I showed you already as the basis for how to apply the patterning on this dog. Use the base coat of pastel blue to paint in all of the saliva elements. You want to be careful with this part, not to get any of that overpaint onto the fur in the surrounding areas. And then on the tongue, as the saliva globs sort of fade into the actual tongue texture itself, you can see that I'm just applying some dotting, some texturing to blend the saliva into the dotting or texturing of the tongue. And then from there, I'll use greenish white to just apply a very soft highlight on the upper parts of the saliva. So we're looking primarily at this big glob at the very tip, and then some of the more pronounced bumps on the saliva bits on the top and bottom of the tongue. I think the eyes, I'm gonna be using Tenebrous Gray and White Sands. So I've already used Tenebrous Gray to basically base coat or fill in the eye socket. And then I'm going in with White Sands to paint the actual white of the eye. So what I wanna do is, Fill in most of the socket, leaving a bit of that canvas gray as a black line all around the edge. The reason I'm using canvas gray and white sands, they're basically an off white and an off black. Using pure black and pure white ends up being too stark of a contrast. It looks too cartoony. Going just in on the values helps to make it feel a little bit more realistic and more natural. Once I've got the whites of the eyes painted, I'm gonna go back in with Tenebus Gray. I'm gonna start with a dot in the center of the pupil just to give myself a starting point or baseline to where I want to actually paint the pupils of the eyes. From there, I determine where I want the character looking. Here, I want him looking, because of the way that his body and face are angled, kind of looking a bit down. I want the eyes to be angled back up so he's staring forward. So you can see that I've brought up the pupils and I've filled them up so that they sit touching the upper eyelid, leaving a bit of a gap of the white underneath. Once you're relatively happy with the position of the pupils, it's a matter of going back in with both a mix of tenebrous gray and white sands and just fine tuning the shape, getting those pupils to be almost a perfect circle. And then where necessary, going back in with the white sands and correcting the edge, fixing up any mistakes or overpaint. I'm gonna use Sahara Yellow to paint in the colored part of the pupil. I think it's the cornea. Much like with painting the white of the eye, I'm gonna fill in the pupil, leaving a bit of that tenebrous gray on the edge as a black line. It helps that Lockjaw's eyes are so big, painting this on this scale of miniature is actually really simple. From there, I'll use Volcanic Yellow to highlight the eye. Because I want a white specular dot highlight coming from the top, 
I'm going to be highlighting this broad sort of reflected highlight with the volcanic yellow from the bottom. So you can see that I'm just focusing those highlights more and more on the bottom of that cornea. So instead of doing your, your traditional top to bottom, bright to dark, because this is sort of like an inverted prism, I'm going to be highlighting bottom to top. Using Tenebus Gray, I'll go back in and paint the black dot for the eye, making sure to leave a symmetrical or uniform amount of yellow around. And then using pure white, we're just gonna dot the upper corner of the eye to form our specular highlight. And you wanna dot them on the same position on both eyes. So using this Dunkelgelb Osgalb 1944, long name, we're gonna apply a base coat to the teeth and the claws. The teeth are fairly simple, but on each of the paws, I'm gonna be honest, the, the claws don't really exist. They're just sort of um, ambiguous nubs. So do your best to just approximate the shape and position of the claws and then just paint in that inverted teardrop. I've avoided going too heavy on the black lining or the shadows because I felt it would make it too cartoony and separated. From there, I'll mix in pale sands and apply my highlights. For the teeth, you can probably just do a straight 50-50 mix and um, dilute it and just quickly fade it down. For the paws themselves, it might require a few more transition highlights. Paint the tuning fork, I'm gonna start with a base coat of blue-green. Again, be careful not to overpaint onto any of the skin or fur in the surrounding areas. Make sure you get them on the sides and on the back of the tuning fork as well. From there, because I'm lazy, I'm gonna be doing a wet blend from pastel green into my blue green. You can do layered highlights if you want as well, but I find for something like this, wet blending is pretty fast, pretty easy, and I'm pretty comfortable with it. The goal is to get the highlights up to that pure um, pale blue highlight. From there, I'm gonna use pure pastel green, and I'm gonna apply a very soft edge highlight over the tuning fork. So for this one, I'm gonna apply it over both the front and the back. It'll help to use the side of your brush to gently drag the paint along the edge to capture those edge highlights. And then using pure white, I'll apply some sharp edge highlights on the upper front part of the tuning fork. So you're looking at the tips on the very front and then those corners on the sides as well. Finally, I'm gonna finish off with a shade of Games Workshop's Juchi Violet. I'm gonna be using the airbrush for this. The mix is about 50-50 from the pot, paint to water. Again, the compressor is set to about 15 PSI and I'm gently just under spraying on the miniature. The goal here is to capture the paint in the mid and shadow tones. And then because we're spraying from underneath, we're leaving those highlight areas untouched. Areas of focus I really wanna capture are the undersides of the neck and the belly, the deep shadows of the jowls, and then the shadow area in the eye socket as well. So we're looking at the corners or the bridges of the nose, as well as in the outer corners of the eyes. And again, you can always do this by hand if you want, but I find especially on a big model like this, big surface area, using the airbrush is fast, and it gives you a nice consistent finish where with a brush, you have more control, but it's a harder technique to pull off. And then finally, once the miniature is fully painted, I'm gonna be using some printed posters to just decorate the base. So with some tweezers and some Mod Podge or PVA glue, I'm just going to apply the poster and then tweeze and bend to shape the poster to how I want. Give it a little bit more motion and make it feel um, a little bit more natural and not just a flat image, paste it to the ground. I'll apply a layer of Mod Podge on top as well to help seal and protect the paper. And then finally, I'll finish off with a layer of weathering powders. This is a 50-50 mix of dark yellow ochre and burnt umber from Vallejo. I use this on all my Marvel models, and it's a way of introducing just that extra element or a common color that helps unify all the color palettes of my collection. So all of my Marvel models, regardless of affiliation, use the same basing scheme. And it's a way of being able to mix and match the models, regardless of what the actual model's color palette looks like. 
I'm going to be pretty selective with this. Remember, it's always easier to add more than it is to remove weathering powders. And I want to make sure that I focus some on the posters and newspaper as well, just to give it a bit more weathering and a little bit more color. Once I'm happy with the effect, I'm just going to spritz some mineral spirits to help seal and fix the pigment powders. This will take about 45 minutes to an hour to fully dry. Once it does, I'm going to first dull coat the model to help protect it from gameplay. I'll repaint the base trim black, and then you can see that I'm going in with some gloss varnish after I've matte varnished the model, and I'm applying some gloss to the eyes, the nose, the inside of the mouth, the tongue, and the saliva. I do apologize for the focus on this element or part of the video. I forgot to put my camera on manual focus and it chose to autofocus on my fingers and not the dog. And there is our finished lockjaw. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you're able to take these techniques and this recipe to apply to your own lockjaw as well as some other animals that you're going to paint for yourself. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you like and subscribe for more awesome weekly content. If you want to check my other social media platforms, I'll make sure to have links in the video description below. As always, until next time, happy hobbying.